Um, also, I, I want to uh, just let all everybody know that at some point during this hour, it's very possible that I may have to pause and get up and go answer the door for a FedEx delivery. We're accepting a delivery for one of my neighbors. Hey, this is great. I don't know if you heard over in Seattle, somewhere in Seattle, there is a distillery. It usually makes like, I don't know, brandy, whiskey or some other. They shut down their whole facility and they're making um, hand sanitizer now. Which, awesome, it's a cool thing to do. So our neighbors ordered, I don't know, like a case of this hand sanitizer, but because it comes from this distillery, they require someone 21 or older to sign for it. And both the mom and dad are at work and the two kids are at home and they tried to deliver it. And they're like, kids are like, they're like, no kids, you can't sign for this. It's from a distillery. So they asked us, would you sign for our hand sanitizer? Uh, so I, so I, if, as long as I'm home, if, if the, the car, the truck comes, I gotta go down the side. So that's that. Okay. Um, well, we are, we're in our last week guys. This is, this is going to be it. And it's kind of, I don't know, kind of exciting, kind of bittersweet, I think, that this journey is going to end uh, so quickly. But I think it's going to end with some stuff that's going to really blow your mind, which is super cool. It's kind of cool to go out really feeling like you learned something this year. So um, I want to start, and I'm going to go back and turn the whiteboard on now. Um, I want to go and talk about complex numbers. And I know we talked about it before, but oh, got a whole lot more to show you right now. So as you recall, a complex number is expressed in the form of A plus BI. So like three plus six I would be a typical complex number. And the way, the place that we traditionally saw these was when we were solving, well, quadratics, ultimately polynomials, but generally quadratic equations, where we had, you know, this negative discriminant, we get into the imaginary numbers and all the weirdness with imaginary. What you may not know, and that's what I'm hoping to show you today, or actually this week, is that complex numbers are very intimately tied to trigonometry. And there's a strange connection between these numbers, which don't seem like anything to do with angles or anything in trig, and trigonometry. So we're going to get there eventually, but today I just want to show you something about complex numbers that I'm guessing most of you have not seen before. So you might recall that um, we had issues trying to show or graph a complex number. Like, when, when the roots of a quadratic were complex, we weren't able to graph those on a, on a graph. And obviously, if I did something like this, made a number line here, and I put you know zero here, and I go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and we'll go out here, 10, and then one, two, three. So if I have this number line right here, and I wanted to put a number on here, I could put a number on it as long as it was real. But as soon as we get to complex or imaginary numbers, we always say like, oh, well, you can't put those on here. Well, the reality is, the reason why we can't put a complex or imaginary number on this line is that we're not thinking in enough dimensions. Okay, so what I want to show you is what complex numbers look like when you get out of a one-dimensional number line and move instead to a two-dimensional complex plane. Take a good look at this plane here. And I want to explain what you're seeing here. We no longer have an X or Y axis. And I want to explain to you why that is. X and Y only make sense when we're plotting a point using coordinates. A point using real number coordinates. X was a coordinate, Y was a coordinate. 
That's not what we're doing here. I'm not plotting points. That black dot on the screen is not a point. It is a number. Not on a number line, because a line is only one dimensional, and we need two dimensions to graph a complex number. So instead of x, y axes, we have a real axis and an imaginary axis. And so we're going to actually plot a number on a plane. The number 3 plus 4i is plotted by going 3 units over on the real axis and 4 units up on the imaginary axis. So you know that every complex number has a real part and an imaginary part. And so um, we can now graph numbers on a plane. So let me go back to uh, the whiteboard. And what I want to do is uh, create now a complex plane. And maybe if you have your own paper too, I would do that as well. I'm just going to go ahead and put some markings. I'm not going to put too many here. Let's go five in each direction. I'll give you a second to do that because I'm going to ask you to start plotting some, some uh, complex numbers here. I almost said plotting points. We're not plotting points anymore. We're plotting numbers. Instead of numbers on a number line, it's now numbers on a complex plane. And I've got several different examples here. And then we'll get into a couple of the characteristics of complex numbers in a graphical sense. We good? Lucas, Damon, you have your graphs ready to go? Okay. So I want to start with the number four. Where on this complex plane with the number four? And by the way, this is um, real and this is imaginary. Again, keep in the back of your mind. This is all related to trig, even though today it's not, there's no, there's no really trig going on today. That's coming on Wednesday. So where do we plot the number four? I assume that means. Right. Yeah, yeah perfect, yeah. perfect. One, two, three, four, right here. But I'm not gonna write it as four comma zero. I'm writing it just as the number four. Okay, where do I, I, these are easy so far. Where do I put the number uh, minus three? Right, three units to the left, right here, minus three. Now, I want to make something really clear. And this is where this kind of blows my mind too. All those times that you and I, that we were graphing on a number line, like all those times we were using this number line right here, we were actually using the complex plane. We were just ignoring the vertical part of it. So I can plot the number four on a number line just fine. It's really four plus zero i minus three plus zero i. But I can plot those on a number line no problem, but there's a whole other dimension going on that I didn't know about. So. Where is this number going to be? Where is 2i going to be found? Well, there's no, yes, right, Damien. There's no real component to this, but 2i sits right here. This is 0 plus 2i. It's at 2 on the imaginary axis. And then just to, I, I hope this is painfully easy for you. I want it to be that way. Where is minus 5i going to be located? Straight down, right? One, two, three, four, five down here. So this is minus 5i, but you can think of it as 0 minus 5 because there's no real component to it. There's just a imaginary component. OK, now it's going to get interesting. Because now we'll, we'll put in some um, complex numbers. How about this one? Minus 2 plus 3i. Now you can think of this 
in the same way you used to think about plotting points, but I want you to tell yourself over and over again, this is not a point, this is a number. I go to minus two on the real axis, and I go up three on the imaginary axis. This is not negative two comma three. It's negative two plus three i. We are literally plotting numbers, but we're doing it now in two dimensions instead of one dimension. How about one minus four i? Just for another example. We're gonna move over one on the real axis and then down four. So we have one minus four i. Okay. So far, not too weird. Okay, good. So then uh, let me move on to the next page. The, the next concept is absolute value. And again, we're pretty comfortable with absolute value from a number line perspective. And this is back to algebra one days. The absolute value of any number as expressed on the number line is simply how far that number is from zero, right? So if I go back here, I mean, the absolute value of nine is nine because it's nine units away from zero. Absolute value of negative six is six because it's six units away from zero. But the problem is, what do you do when you aren't on a number line? Like, like, what is the absolute value of negative 2 plus 3i? And here's where you get to rely on the definition. If you haven't figured out by now, at this stage in your math career, it's good to, to, to note this. Definitions are really important. If I want to know the absolute value of negative 2 plus 3i, then what I'm really asking for is how far is that number from zero? I think, Lucas, what I see you doing is this and this and that. A distance formula away. Yes, yes. Pythagoras comes back. We have minus two here, we have three here, but this is gonna be the square root of minus two squared plus three squared, which is the square root of four plus nine equals the square root 13. So by definition, the absolute value is the distance to zero. And to be clear, this is not the distance to the origin can't use that term anymore. There is no origin. Because we're not, <laughs> there is no origin. But we're not graphing points anymore. We're just graphing numbers. So this, this number right here is the number zero. So absolute value is now the distance to that zero. And if you haven't figured out by now, it's worthwhile to note that this way of thinking about the absolute value of a complex number is nothing more than considering that number as if it were a vector and finding the length of that vector. Does that, does that work at all? Because we, we, we took the vector, broke it into components, used Pythagorean theorem, and off we went. So, I'm sort of slowly trying to form this clay into some cool little thing that says, this all kind of relates together, it connects together. Um, real quickly, what would the absolute value of say negative six i be? Six. Yeah, so one, two, three, four, five, six. This concept right here, is no different than if it was on the uh, real number line. As long as you're on one of the axes, the real axis or the imaginary axis, you just count spaces to zero. 
So it's not difficult at all to find the absolute value of real numbers or pure imaginary numbers. It gets a little bit tricky when you have to find the absolute value of a complex number because you've got to get into these two dimensions to deal with the Pythagorean theorem. Okay. Next step, adding complex numbers. And I think you all will look back on when we did that before and think, yeah, it wasn't that hard. 3 plus 4i plus 5 minus 2i. And most of you can look at that and like, oh, 3 plus 5 makes 8. 4 minus 2 is 2a plus 2i, and off we go. So that's interesting. But what I want to do is have you look at this through the eyes of the complex plane. And let's really think about what 3 plus 4i looks like. 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 4, right here. 3 plus 4i. And then 5 minus 2i is going to be here. 5 minus 2i. So <clears throat> visually, this is pretty unsettling, I think. Like, how do you add those two dots together? How do you add those two numbers together? And the way I want you to think about it, and I'm telling you it's okay to think about it this way, is to consider each of these complex numbers as if it were a vector. Because then, when you add vectors together, what you do is you do the 3 plus 4i, then you do the 5 minus 2i, and that actually puts us at 8 plus 2i. It's this, this distance right here. Does that, does that make any sense at all? That, that adding two complex numbers is conceptually the same kind of process as adding vectors that would take us from the number zero to each of those two respective points. So adding is fine. It shouldn't be that big a deal. Um, you get some exercises with that. It's this last piece though that I, I find potentially really confusing and troubling. And that is uh, subtracting. I'm going to tell you why I find it confusing and troubling. And I hope I confuse you a little bit first and then it makes everything clearer. Because here's, here's my problem with subtracting. When we go back to our days of the number line, say like 7 minus 4. We think of the word difference as equal to the word distance. Here's what I mean by that. I have a number line here. I got 0 and then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And I want to find 7 like, I can almost predict some of you learned how to do this in like second grade when you learned about subtraction. You went to seven and you went, oh, I've got to go one, two, three spaces over. Seven minus four makes three. Why? Because seven and four are a distance of three units apart. So we learn, in fact, even this, what about this one? Five minus negative two. Why is that answer seven? Because if we start at five, which is right here, and we go to minus two, they are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven units apart. We, we literally count the distance between numbers on the number line, and off we go. Okay, now, 
that's all fine and good. The problem lies in this concept. If you hang on to this concept, it's going to mess with you when we get into subtracting complex numbers. And I want to show you this. Um, this will this will be about about the end of it today. So let's take three plus four i minus. These are the same numbers I had before. Five minus two i. Okay. Now, based on our rules of subtraction, I don't anticipate this is going to be that difficult. We have three minus five. And then bear with me, every complex number is in the form of a plus bi, right? So I'm gonna put a plus here, but I'm gonna write four i minus negative two i, and this leads to minus two plus six i. Minus two plus six i. And if I go back here real quick, so, 3 plus 4i minus 5 minus 2i is, is that. I go back here and I think about adding the opposite of this one. Then this vector, let me erase it, but that vector right there would then turn into something like, oh, hang on, um, this. Right, doing the opposite. And if I add those two together, I could maybe move this up here. I end up at minus two. Whoop. End up at minus two, one, two, three, four, five, plus six i. So the subtraction process, I'm gonna erase all these because I don't want to confuse things. But the subtraction process visual, whoops, visually should make some sense. The problem is again in trying to think about subtraction as being the word difference and distance at the same time. Because once we have complex numbers, now distance means something very, very different. What does distance mean? One, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four. Watch. Distance means one, two, three, one, two, three, four, right there. And five, one, two, three, four, five. One, two. The distance between two numbers is not the same as the difference because the distance is this. What do you think about that? And the distance is going to be oops, a number. In fact, it's likely going to be a real number. It's going to be a real number. Why? Because we're going to do the square root. This is the distance formula of five minus three squared plus, um, go in the right direction here, minus two minus four squared, which is the square root of two squared plus minus six equals the square root of 40, or two root 10. What do you think about that? The difference between those two is minus two plus six i. The distance between those two numbers is the square root of 40. Now I'm gonna ask you, do you see any connection between those two answers? No. What do I get if I square that number right there and square that number right there? 
You get four and 36, don't I? And the number minus Sorry, two. I thought that was a three. Say what? I thought that was a three. Sorry, this, this is a two. So this number right here, minus two plus six I, is, a, is the difference when I subtract those two. The absolute value of that difference is the distance. Now I think I've thoroughly confused you. So let me go back just for a second. In simple real world terms, real number terms, difference and distance means the same thing. In the world of complex numbers, difference is going to be another complex number. Distance will be the absolute value of that complex number. And if you think about it, that's not terribly different here because I could have also done, like for this problem here, I could have done minus two minus five equals negative seven, but we would have said the distance is seven. So by default, in the real world, real number world, we typically will talk about the distance as being the positive version and the difference being positive or negative, depending on which way you subtract. But in the complex world, they're very different ideas. A subtraction is going to give you another complex number, whereas the distance between numbers, and don't lose sight of the fact these are not points. They are numbers. The difference is a number. The distance is this real number. Absolutely not. Kind of mind-boggling, but actually kind of cool, too. So what I want you to do for the next couple of days is get yourself reacquainted with complex numbers. We haven't talked about them in quite some time because Wednesday it's going to get really crazy with complex numbers and trig's going to come in. And Wednesday, Thursday are going to be some of my favorite days of the entire year because it's so crazy. I'll give you this hint though. I'm going to show you how to find something like the sixth root of the number one. And there are six of them. Is it one? There are six roots of one. One of them is the number one, yeah. But the, the other five are not. So there's this whole world out there that we haven't even dared think possible. And that's what I'm going to show you. The, the, the cube root of negative eight, there's three of those, not one. And I know that negative two is the cube root of negative eight, right? That's one of them. There's two more. But you can't wait, huh? All right, here's your assignments for the next couple of days. I want you to do uh, page 443, nine through 42, multiples of three. And then uh, you know, I, I'm, I've already given you credit for this, but the next day's assignment was going to be same plus one, and then 51 to 54. And and you know, look, if you don't want to do all of those, that's whatever. That's that's this is what I would have assigned you. I would, however, for day two, I think I'd, I'd really like you. Not I think I would really like you to do those problems for sure. Those are true false problems. And you might remember from class, those are really interesting, challenging, fairly confusing problems. And you know, maybe we'll, we'll, we might talk over any of the questions that you might have from the regular problems, but I wanna for sure go through 51 to 54 um, on Wednesday in class, just to see how you feel about this, the, these, these ideas of complex. So, um, that's all I have. Did any, did any of you have issues or questions about last week's assignment? Dot products? I just gave you, just gave you one day's worth. I don't remember exactly. It was 4.30 something. 
I just want to know if there's any, any issues from page four, 35 and six. So again, I think I'm trying to give you mostly, yeah, Lucas. One problem. Yeah. I'm trying to give you mostly um, odd problems so that you at least check your answers, but not all of them I did where it was odd. Uh, 41, I think. 41. Let me just go on and do this. Is... Or 39. 41 or 39. 41. So we're trying to find the angle between these two. Well, can I just say that 41, uh, these are perpendicular? I can just look at the vectors yeah, and say they're perpendicular. 41. Okay, that's all 41, then 39. Yeah, let's let's do 39 instead. But but to be clear, the dot product would come out to be zero, which is what tells you that it's gonna be 90 degrees. So we've got u equals huh. Isn't it funny that now we're using I, I again? But that I is not the same I as we did today. It's a different I. And V is um, negative 7I plus 5J. Okay. So do you remember the formula? We had cosine theta equals U dot V over the magnitude of u times the magnitude of v. Do mm, you remember that formula? You may not have it memorized, but remember that looking kind of familiar? Mm -hmm. And if we want to find the angle between uh, these um, vectors, we, we're going to have to solve for cosine theta. So I'm going to go ahead and just solve this straight up. u dot v will be minus 21 plus 20. Do you know where I got that? Okay, just in case anybody's watching this or isn't sure where I got this, I multiplied the x components and got minus 21, multiplied the y components and got 20. All over, now the square, the, the magnitude of u is gonna be the square root of three squared plus four squared. I think you can figure out it's going to be five. Makes three, four, five right triangle. And the magnitude of V is going to be the square root of minus seven squared plus five squared, which is 49 plus 25. Square root of 74. That's really sloppy here. Let me fix this. This is 49. Plus 25. So what I end up with is the cosine of theta is minus one over five root 74. And I'll get my calculator out here, but before I do this, I want to remind you, if this cosine is negative, which means it's going to put us right about here. You got me? Just very slightly negative, which means this angle will be a little bit bigger than 90 degrees. Just a little bit bigger than, than 90 degrees. I'm anticipating that in my problem. Now, how much bigger? I'll just go ahead and do this. I go inverse cosine of one divided by five square root 74 Hmm getting a weird one divided by five. Oh, because I did, yeah, you're right. Sorry, I'm doing my calculator wrong. Uh, inverse cosine of that. Uh, I get, well, the cosine is negative 0 0.023. And then theta comes out to be, uh, let me do that again. Just a just sec. Inverse cosine 91.33. 
So I, I got into trouble on my calculator with this right here, because if you don't put parentheses in the right spot, you get some really funky answers. So Lucas, how does that look? All right, I just had problems with the negatives and the cosine, and now I get that. Like here? Yeah. Okay. But now I know how to solve it. Yeah, one thing that you might do, the calculators get a little funky with this, especially when you have a, a product of numbers in the denominator. Maybe just calculate this number first and then do inverse cosine, but it should come out. Okay, anybody else have anything? Okay, so uh, you've got a couple days worth of work. Um, you don't have to spend both days working on it, but I will give you a chance to try one. Um, check it out. If you want to do some more problems, uh, you can. But for sure, I'd like you to, at the end of all this, do put problems 51 to 54. We'll be back here Wednesday and Thursday uh, this week to wrap up the very last section. There will be no test on chapter six. Um, next Monday, I will post your first practice final exam. And then we'll talk about this more Thursday, but then I'll have um, office hours, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, excuse me, next week, where you can just drop in. I'll be there for half an hour or so if you want. Drop in, just take a look at certain problems, go through them if you want. And uh, if you don't want to, you don't have to come and everything's going to be fine. Good? Good. All right, you guys, be good. I'll see you Wednesday morning. See ya.